All right. He is here. The great Mick West. Very excited to have you back on the show to talk about these issues, which I feel like nobody knows more about than you. How have you been, sir? I've been doing good. It's uh, interesting times and I've been uh, quite busy. Well, you know, I, I wonder if I maybe I missed it. But this latest story that we're going to talk about, this this guy, David Grush, it seems like the biggest thing since, was it two years ago, where all those videos came out from the Navy? Or have there been a bunch of other stories on UFOs or what do we call them now uh, that we've missed? Yeah, it's actually been about five years ago now since the like the New York Times piece, uh, which wow. was you know also Leslie Keen and Ralph Blumenthal, same two authors who wrote the debrief piece about Dave Grush. So yeah, this is I I think you know if this is true what is being said, then it's definitely bigger than that. And so you know there's a lot more interest and also a lot more scrutiny, and I think it really deserves a lot more scrutiny. Um. Why do you say that if this is true, first of all, and also why would this deserve more scrutiny than past stories, leaks, videos, tapes? Well, if you look back at uh, you know, the previous story, say the New York Times story of uh, 2017, it was I think December 2017. And uh, that was that was written by Leslie Keen and Ralph Blumenthal, uh, but they they essentially brought receipts. They they brought these videos uh, of uh, of craft, which were you know essentially official Navy videos that were of unidentified flying objects. Uh, and they they had an interview with uh, Lou Elizondo, who did actually work in some capacity on you know, essentially some type of UFO investigation program. Uh, and, and so they, they have kind of a lot more back then than they do now. Right now, we have essentially one person. We have Dave Grush telling us that other people have told him that we have a reverse engineering program for crashed alien spacecraft, essentially, and that we have recovered alien bodies from those crashed spacecraft. And uh, you know, we, we have a very limited uh, set of snippets of interviews with him, uh, with this journalist, Ross Colfart, uh, who's an Australian journalist who's done a lot of stories on, on the UFO culture. Uh, and we know that he's, uh, uh, they've been working together for some time and they've been talking to other people. Like I've, I've heard that uh, uh, Dave Grush uh, has been to the Canadian government and to talked to members of parliament of the Canadian uh, parliament uh, about this thing and a kind of a you know, kind of a road show where he's been going around with people like Gary Nolan and maybe Lou Elizondo people like that so there's this small group of people who are kind of relaying this uh, this narrative but really all we have so far is essentially hearsay you know we have someone who's credential you know he worked in the uh, intelligence community and he had clearances and there are other people who will vouch for him but we don't have any of the documents we don't have any photo evidence and we he himself dave grush hasn't even seen the photos hasn't seen the photos of these supposed craft uh, so you know there's a lot of questions there and you know i think over the next few days and weeks we'll hopefully learn some answers to that Dave Grush, apparently, you know, he sounds like a really credible guy. He's a former combat officer in Afghanistan. He's a veteran of the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, which I didn't know existed, and the National Reconnaissance Office. He served as the Reconnaissance Office's representative to the Unidentified Aerial Phenomena Task Force from 19 to 21, 2019. From late 21 to 22, he was the NGA's co-lead for U. AP analysis and it's representative to the task force and who would know more than this guy about what the government knows about these unidentified aerial phenomena well you'd think that the head of the UAP task force would uh, perhaps the head of arrow uh, perhaps uh, the people who have testified to congress already like uh, scott moultrie uh, people who you know do have clearances people who are actually working on these things now. You know, Dave Grush is retired uh, from the, the service and I, he's working on some other job in Colorado. Uh, so there's a lot of people. He's a young guy. I think he's, he's, he's quite young. He's like 35 or something. There's lots more people who have been in the government 
uh, uh, and the military a lot longer than he have, and people who would know a lot more about these programs than him. And you know, as he has said himself, he never worked on the programs. He never worked on the crash recovery programs. He he says he knows people who did. But when he was asked the other day uh, on News Nation about what evidence was there that uh, these craft were crashed alien technology, what he came up with was essentially the kind of the old talking points that we've heard before in, in UFO culture. He said that there were um, metals of unusual isotopic ratios. You know, normally on, uh, on Earth, when you dig metal out of the ground, it comes in a specific ratio of like the two types of, of, of that metal or maybe two or three types as metal can be in different isotopes, uh, which is just a slightly different uh, uh, configuration of the, of that metal. Uh, and you know, when you dig it out of the ground, it's in a specific ratio. So it's kind of like a signature of whether it's terrestrial or not. Now you can actually make metals have different ratios uh, of, of their, their isotopes, but you have to kind of engineer it. You'd have to mix the different metals isotopes together to get a sp specific ratio. So the evidence he comes up with is, is something that doesn't prove that it's from off world. It's something that could have been made on this planet. And then he mentioned something about um, uh, metals, heavy metals with high atomic numbers in, in odd configurations. And that really just sounds like this uh, this little chip of metal that people have been talking about for I think decades now. I think it goes back to Art Bell, the Art Bell radio show, when people oh, yeah. anonymously yeah. sent him in like bits of metal that uh, they said they'd found with with um, ridiculous backstories about you know telepathy and uh, contact with aliens and stuff like that. Uh, but this bit of metal has been floating around. It's 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 a little triangular piece of metal and it's uh, layered. Uh, zinc, magnesium, and bismuth. Uh, zinc and uh, bismuth are heavy metals, and bismuth has a high atomic number, so that kind of matches what he just described. But this isn't anything new. This is just the type of thing that you know people are being claiming as evidence for for decades, but it never really went anywhere because these are things that could be manufactured on Earth. So the evidence that he had that they're aliens is you know just the same old stuff that we've heard before. And you know what about the bodies? I mean, if you've got a crashed alien craft with aliens in it, surely that should be the best evidence that we're being visited by aliens. But you know, no, it's just this old isotope nonsense. Leslie Keen and this other uh, gentleman who wrote this latest piece for the debrief. Ralph Blumenthal, uh, you mentioned several other names, probably most people listening. I'm not familiar with most of those other names that you mentioned. But what about Leslie? I mean, where does her credibility lie? I remember reading that, I think, like 35 page New Yorker story, which included you in it. And I think that's how I discovered your work. But, you know, where where does her what? Tell me a little bit about her past. Do you think she's generally arguing and in good faith with with these articles that she's been on this beat for a very long time. I don't know this other fellow that she co-wrote it with. Yeah, uh, I think she is. Uh, both her and, and Ralph Blumenthal, I think, believe in what they write. Uh, but I think their their belief in in the, the broader picture of the you know, they both believe uh, that there probably are some kind of extraterrestrials or or some other non-human intelligence, and it covers a variety of things, uh, is visiting us with, with UFOs. Uh, the her other author, Ralph Blumenthal, is a big fan of uh, a psychiatrist called John Mack, who uh, was really interested in abductions. And he would interview lots of people about you know, abductions and people who had been visited by aliens. You know, people, sometimes there are mass sightings of aliens by school children in a schoolyard. Yeah, there's no real evidence it happened, but the school kids say it did, and he interviews them. And he, he's one of these people who believes in it. And you know, Ralph Blumenthal's book was called The Believer about John Mack. So, and I think that kind of that idea of someone being a believer in in all these testimonies is is something that typifies the ufo community and i don't think leslie keen is an exception like she's been writing about ufology and to some degree the paranormal uh for quite some time uh her last book was about life after death i think that might have been what it was actually called 
And uh, she wrote a book before that, which is about, I think, UFOs, uh, generals, and and the military, something along those lines. But it was about how she talked to people high up in the military who believed that UFOs were real. And you know, hence, she saw that as being evidence that the UFOs and aliens are real. So you know, all these people that are involved in promoting and writing and distributing this story right now uh, are people who have a pre-existing belief right. that uh, aliens are visiting us. I think it's, you know, for me, it's most important to know the source of any information, which is why you are here. Uh, her book, by the way, that book you reference, I think is titled Surviving Death, A Journalist Investigates mm -hmm. Evidence for an Afterlife. Yes, yes, that's the one. That's the latest book. And uh, yeah, she's she's been into uh, that type of thing. She goes to seances uh, as a journalist. But you know, she she uh, essentially seems to think that there's something to them. When you go to a seance, like a medium uh, materializes you know, things and there are disembodied hands touching you. And you know, from her accounts of that, she seems to believe that there's some legitimacy to that, which it doesn't seem like a super scientific way of looking at things. And I think perhaps some of that, that attitude might uh, carry over to her, her work on UFOs. You're a scientific guy. I'm a guy who likes scientific guys. <laughs> and um, I think what you're saying is if I had some kind of uh, uh, an experience, a paranormal experience, and I believe I have it. And I mean, I know a lot of people who do. I wish I had one. I always wish I, I'll sleep in a Civil War battlefield to see a ghost. I really want that to happen. Yeah. But the point of what you're saying is people can have those experiences and they can 110 percent believe that it happened. But totally. science has been unable to prove those types of things like the hands touching your body or pretty much anything like that paranormal experiences. Is that what I'm hearing you say? Yeah, I mean, the thing with, say, seances, for example, is that it's it's got a long, long history of, of charlatans. And a seance basically is a stage magician uh, operating with the great advantage, usually, of it being in a very dimly lit or an entirely dark room, uh, just performing magic tricks, uh, to usually to a paying audience who who think that he, is, or, he or she is connecting uh, them with dead spirits. So it's there's, there's a long history of of people faking this. And there's also a long history of, uh, of people exposing it to like uh, debunkers and skeptics, like going back to Harry Houdini. He, Harry Houdini, it's, he was a, a stage magician, but he never claimed to be actually performing magic. And he got quite angry at, uh, at these, these, uh, these mediums and he would go to the seances and try to expose them. Uh, so yeah, there's, there's um, a credulity, I think, that comes with uh with like believing in subjects like that which perhaps doesn't make you an ideal person to investigate claims uh about right. something that you already believe in why do you think you're such an ideal person mick west because i do i mean i've been watching your stuff read your book like i mean people say let's see i you know as soon as you're by the way one of these people not unlike let me think like a Michael Mann. He's a climate scientist, friend of mine, uh, Peter Hotez, who, uh, of course, is a vaccine expert uh, and doctor friend of mine. You're in that category where if I tweet or retweet something that you wrote, an army of people come to discredit you in this yeah. case. Um, you deal with these people on a very regular basis. Uh, you know, one guy said, well, you know, Mick doesn't have all the information. I was like, well. Who does like who, who, what mm -hmm. journalist does? What, who, who has all of the information? Who do you possibly trust then? Yeah, well, what I do is look at the information that's actually available. You know, what's the public information that's out there, you know, especially things like UFO videos. And you know, my background is a software engineer in the video game industry, which may not seem like much. Like Mick West is just a game designer. People, people say that all the time, but you actually have a, kind of a unique set of skills as a video game programmer. Like just the, the simple uh, act of making a, a 3D object display on a 2D screen is the exact same math that you need for analyzing UFO videos, because you're taking a 2D screen and trying to recreate where it is in three dimensions. And the simple physics that we use in uh, video games 
is what you need to analyze things like the position and the size and the 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 the, the, the motion, uh, the acceleration uh, of of objects in these videos. So you know, I'm, I've been doing that type of thing for 20, 30 years, uh, and it overlapped with my my interest in UFOs, and so I got pretty good at analyzing UFO videos. And just along with that, you know, I'm naturally a skeptical person. So it doesn't mean I disbelieve everything, but it means that I, I need to have, I need to see the evidence for things. Yeah. And I think the biggest criticism that people have of me is that I don't listen to the eyewitnesses, but, but I do listen to the eyewitnesses. But unfortunately, I also recognize that eyewitness testimony isn't the most reliable evidence. And if we have hard evidence like videos, we really should go and analyze that first and see if that actually tells us anything and then see how the eyewitness testimony fits into the context of that. Ah, so well said. I mean, your background, obviously, it's, it's kind of who would expect that, you know, but it's actually perfect uh, in, in terms of understanding certainly these videos. But you also seem to understand, I don't know if you're self-taught or if you've referenced others, physics. When it comes to these videos, you understand physics and you also really understand photography and video and how it works. Explain a little bit about how that helps you. I mean, most people see these videos. I think you'll agree. I certainly did. Um, the ones from a few years ago and say, this is completely unexplainable. This has mm -hmm. to be from some other world. And then I read your explanation. It doesn't mean I completely understand it, but it's a pretty good explanation debunking these things. Tell me a little bit more about your understanding of physics and cameras and lenses as to how that helps you explain these videos, especially away, because they seem pretty damning. Yeah, well, it's, it's kind of a combination of things. I've always been interested in photography. I've had a, you know, a good camera since I was you know, in my teens a very long time ago. Uh, and the video Still, game. Still, look at you. I can see the pores in your skin. You have the best camera of any guest I've ever had. The guy knows what he's doing. Go ahead. Sorry, Nick. It's, uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I like the camera I have here. I have a whole bunch of different cameras up on the shelf. It's, uh, the video game stuff teaches you about essentially animation. Uh, animation, of course, is you, you draw one frame, then you go to the next frame, you draw things in a different position. But that's essentially what videos are. Videos are a series of photographs. You get 30 per second or 25 per second or 24 or 29.97 per second, uh, depending on the type of camera you're using. Uh, and I understand how that works exactly, because I do that, I do that from the, the ground up when you're making a video game. You're creating these frames right. from, from information. So I know how to take a video and then deconstruct it into its actual frames. So I, I can take you know this frame here and this frame here, and I know if something's moved from here to here, that indicates either it's moving at that speed or that the camera is rotating by a certain amount or that the camera is moving a certain amount or that it's a combination of two or three of those different things. Uh, and that's something that I think that a lot of people just looking at a video, they don't naturally understand. If you take, for example, uh, you know, one of the more recent videos, this, this Middle East sphere, which has been shown on TV quite a lot alongside uh, Dave Grush's interviews, it's like a silvery ball. And there's this, this video, the camera's focus on a building, and then this ball zips into the frame, and then the camera operator tries to follow this ball. Uh, it's, it's, like, it's drone footage set, shot in the Middle East. And so people are kind of saying, oh, this is a, it's a metallic sphere that's exhibiting you know, highly anomalous behavior. Uh, and you, know, you could kind of understand that interpretation if you don't really know much about how cameras work. Uh, but when you start actually analyzing this particular video, you, first of all, you've got to recognize that the camera's mounting on an MQ-9 Reaper drone, which means that the camera itself is moving at about 150 miles per hour which you know, it's not super fast for a plane, but it's very fast for something moving over the ground. And then you go look at you know, this, this metallic orb and see you know, how big is this? You can, see, you can see in the background there's some telegraph poles behind it, and it's about a bit less than twice the width of that, which means that this, this orb is only about 18 inches across. Uh, and then you take the camera's motion into account and you see that the camera's moving in a certain direction and it, the lane's banked a certain way and you see oh look the motion of this object kind of mirrors your ex the expected motion of the plane and that all leads to the idea that this is not 
you know, an orb that kind of zipping around all over the place. This is just a balloon floating in the wind, doing nothing really special. And all the motion you're seeing is because you've got this super zoomed camera. Uh, and that's another thing you, you learn about in video games is you know depth of field and uh, uh, field of view. So you, we know that you can zoom in on something very far away and it gives this really weird illusion of parallax and it makes things look like they're moving when they're actually not. It's just the camera moving. So all these things combined together, yeah, I can kind of tell what's going on in this video, but it's kind of a little difficult to explain to people because people are not used to putting their mind into that 3D uh, frame of reference. So I don't it's know. Uh, a bit of a I challenge. Think just, I think you just explained it well here, but you're, but that's not being explained in other places, including by a lot of journalists, it would seem, who report this stuff out. Yeah. And including by uh, the people you think would know better as well. It's, it was a, a very surprising mistake that, uh, that Sean Kirkpatrick made at the NASA hearing uh, recently. Like he was showing you know, a new video that I'd never seen before uh, mm. of, of something that was initially um, thought to be anomalous. And you saw these three, three dots on the screen. They're moving back and forth like this. And it looks really weird, you know, what's going on there. And, and he explains it, that uh, this is just the camera moving. And it, it makes the, these objects look like they're moving. And then someone asked him, you know, what are all these, these little white dots in the background? Because you, know, you could see that they were moving because there was these white dots in the background that weren't moving. And this was moving relative to that. And he said, uh, uh, those are stars. Uh, I think those are stars. But, it, you know, it was obvious to me that they were not stars. It was literally impossible for them to be stars based on his explanation because he said the three dots were distant planes and they were all moving because the camera was moving, but these, these, these white dots were not. Uh, and I, so I, I tweeted something about it, about how ridiculous his explanation was. And then after the break, he actually came back and said, uh, I'm not actually that sure about that anymore. But he, he never even really re fully retracted it. Uh, so yeah, you see a lot of that in these 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 videos that they show. With the, the other video he showed, uh, I'm not sure if it was at that hearing or the other one, was uh, shot from one drone, and there's another drone in the distance, and then you see this other object zip by really rapidly. And he said, "This is something that we originally thought was anomalous." So yeah, the the task force was actually fooled by this this parallax illusion at some point. I think there's actually a lot more of this mistaken uh, identification of anomalous behavior than we actually think. And so when they talk about, you know, these spheres are demonstrating apparent anomalous behavior, yeah, I'd like to see what they're actually talking about because their track record so far uh, hasn't been very good. That's uh, shocking and, and disconcerting to hear that experts at NASA have a harder time explaining it than you. Do you yeah, reach this, out? This Did wasn't the NASA that? expert, though. That, just to be clear, that, that this was Sean Kirkpatrick, who is the head of uh, of Arrow, the uh, the old domain anomaly resolution office, which is the Pentagon, uh, not NASA. Got it. Head of the Pentagon's all domain anomaly resolution office, uh, and uh, Harvard professor Avi Loeb teamed up to write that these objects, which appear to defy all physics, could be probes from an extraterrestrial parent craft. I mean, <laughs> how do we know that they are not? I mean, it's, it's you know, basically that they're extrapolating science and science fiction. There, it's like, how would you populate the universe if you wanted to? You would you would send out these what you call von Neumann machines, which are self-replicating machines, which which fly to another world and then they set up a base and then they replicate themselves and then they they make other little von or big von Neumann machines that fly off to other worlds. You know, this is a staple of of both science and science fiction. So what they're basically doing there is kind of riffing on that idea. It's it's nothing nothing special. Uh, but then they mix it all up in a paper that actually is really talking about how if objects are moving very fast in the atmosphere, it would create plasma, and you, so you'd be able to see them glowing, and you'd you'd hear sonic booms, and we don't see or hear that. Therefore maybe these objects are not actually moving as fast as they appear. Now, that's, that's a good point. But they wrap it all up in this, this, this mothership seeding dandelions of, uh, of panspermia, uh, like 
like uh, seeding of planets. It's, you know, it's weird. It is weird. Um, and I'm not sure if when I asked my last question, when you said it could be that if you were being sarcastic or if you were being no. just generous. No, I'm not being sarcastic. Uh, I think it could be, it know, could be what they're saying, but there's, you don't yeah. see the evidence for it. Yeah, I don't see any evidence at all, and it seems very unlikely uh, that this would just be the hap happen to be the one moment in history that uh, that uh, alien craft are visiting this particular spot in the universe when we see no evidence of life anywhere else in the universe. Uh, it's it it's but it's not something that you can rule out. Uh, you know, you could think, you know, what are the odds, for example, that we are the only life that exists in the entire universe? I think that's unlikely. But I don't think it's something that you could actually rule out because it's, it's a possibility because, you know, if, if it's just entirely random, then uh, we, we don't know what, what the odds of life arising are. And even if the odds are quite high, sometimes, you know, in one iteration of the universe, there might be one that life only arises once. So you can't rule out things uh, just because they seem unlikely. So I always try to, you know, basically keep a list of possibilities when I'm talking about uh, what something might be, you know, if you, you take, say, the gimbal UFO video, it's probably, I think, based on my analysis, just a distant plane. It might be something that's moving in a really weird manner that's also kind of hot. Uh, and that thing that's moving in a really weird manner might be an alien spaceship. Of course, the distant plane might be an alien spaceship as well. It's, you know, these are things that you can't rule out. But since we don't really have any evidence of that, and we've got a vast amount of evidence that humans do things in the world, you know, it seems vastly more likely that what we're looking at is, is a human craft. You shared a tweet from Eric Weinstein. Uh, I'm not sure who he is, but I feel like he's kind of a conspiracy guy too. But Yeah, I've, Eric is... Uh, um, isn't he problematic? Is a mathematician. He's kind of like a, a member of the what's called the intellectual dark web. Right. Uh, he likes asking questions. He has a podcast called The Portal, uh, where he talks a lot with with people. And you know, he kind of waded into the UFO world uh, maybe a year or so ago. And I think you know, because he's something of a kind of a, a well known online intellectual, he got courted uh, by by the UFO crowd, probably probably mm -hmm. the same people who, who have courted Dave Grush. Mm. And they promised him that they would show him evidence of basically crashed alien technology, that they were, they were going to take him to a place in the desert or something. This is what he says. And they this happened a few times. Uh, but you know, as he described it, it was like you know, Lucy and the football. You know, he's the Charlie Brown in this scenario, and they were always promising that he's going to get to kick the ball, but every time he goes for it, it was it was snatched away from him. So he became a bit more uh, cynical, and the tweet that I retweeted was basically him uh, warning read, about read the it. current situation. I'll, I'll just read it real quick, um, sure. and then you can, he writes, there's an enormous complex of unbelievably highly conserved narratives to which very sober people will personally attest this is but one of them. I can assure you there are many others. What is more, they are seemingly not all consistent with each other. This puts informants in conflict with each other. What's happening now is that they seem to be crossing the Rubicon of sworn testimony given under oath. That means something will now happen. But keep in mind, one possibility is disinformation. Word to the wise, demand hard evidence before giving belief. There's a ton of, quote, smoke and mirrors out here intended to incinerate credibility. You have been warned. <laughs> All right. Yeah. That's, that's, been warned. that's a complicated, a complicated thing. So, you know, in a part, he's talking about his own experience uh, where people have told him things and he, he recognizes that there are a variance uh, in this, you know, and people within the UFO community don't all agree with each other. Uh, he did a, a kind of an interview with a physicist called Hal Putoff, who's well known in the UFO community uh, as being someone who makes these types of claims, you know, the exact same type of claims that we've had for decades. And Hal Putoff was telling him about how he could easily demonstrate psychic powers. And, and, and uh, um, Eric was <laughs> pretty much incredulous about this. Uh, but, you know, this is all part of, of this 
backdrop of all these different people who are involved in ufology. And so I think he's, because he's been courted by people, he's been hearing a lot of different stories. And one of those stories is the, the whole UFO thing, or at least part of the UFO thing, is a disinformation campaign by the US government. So when you hear a story about a UFO, it's actually a cover for something else. You know, perhaps some kind of uh, uh, you know, advanced technology test that we have. Or it's perhaps uh, a cover for the, the truth about UFOs. You know, perhaps the government does have uh, secret relations with a, a, a government uh, of another star system, which is you know, one of the things that some people claim. Uh, or perhaps, perhaps it doesn't. Perhaps this is all smoke and mirrors. Some people claim that what we are seeing are essentially visitors from another dimension who are creating UFOs as kind of a smokescreen uh, for for their existence or to do, to do something for some purpose, kind of a trickster uh, scenario. And this is people like like Jacques Vallée, who, who is a mentor of Gary Nolan. And Gary Nolan is one of the people who is behind Dave Grush. So you've got these, these overlapping <laughs> narratives uh, that are difficult to reconcile. And that's kind of what Eric is talking about. And he, he's saying, you use caution. And I would certainly advise anybody who is looking into this topic and is talking to anybody on this topic, you know, me included, everybody, use caution because there are a lot of conflicting narratives and they can't all be true. And uh, personally, I feel the more extreme narratives are all nonsense and the, the reality is much more mu mundane. But what do I know? Uh, a lot, which is why I'm talking to you. And I, I share that. I've always shared that. But having learned of your work and a few others, you know, on other subjects, I think that's critical thinking. I think that's logical what you what you're saying to, to come to that outcome you know he mentions uh and i know you know a lot about this the kind of competing narratives you know a lot of the players you've mentioned many of them in, in the ufo world for years and i think what he's saying and what you're saying is they constantly debunk each other they can't there, there's not a lot of uh, synergy with their own theories they're they're often at odds and incongruent with each other is that is that what he's saying is that what you think what you see. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, there are, yeah, the UFO community has people in it who the UFO community kind of lords as heroes, uh, but they kind of disagree with each other. Um, like, like take um, Ger George Knapp and Jeremy Corbell. These are the people who are behind uh, UFO video releases, like the Green Triangle video and the more recent one of uh, like five bright lights in the sky at 29 Palms, which turned out to be flares. Uh, that you know that are being leaked to them by military personnel, but they are big supporters of Bob Lazar. Uh, Bob Lazar is is this old figure in the community who claims basically exactly the same thing as as Grush. Uh, and yet, most people in the UFO community—well, I'm not saying most, but a lot of people in the UFO community discount Bob Lazar's testimony because it's, it's just basically full of holes. He, he uh, made up stuff about his, his academic credentials and things like that. And he used to work in a, in a whorehouse and uh, we got arrested for, for some type of whorehouse related activity. And he has the, all kinds of dodgy things in his background, which kind of like are issues with his cre credibility. So you know, you've got like a couple of the key players supporting him and you've got a lot of the other key players who just won't touch him because he's he's kind of tainted goods uh and so you've got these these different different narratives uh and i think you know it's it's it becomes like almost like you you know, choose your own adventure it's like you, right. you who do you believe which one of these these narratives do you think is is the correct one? Like there was mm -hmm. there was one on uh, on I think like 4chan <laughs> cropped up recently, and it, it was this really kind of a, I don't know enticing possibility. Like the idea was that a an alien mothership landed on Earth thousands of years ago and set up a base underneath the Pacific and set up a kind of a replication shop under the Pacific, this kind of von Neumann scenario, and has been spying on Earth using these little metallic spheres for thousands of years, basically. 
Oh, I love it. <laughs> and, and this is, you know, it's just, it's obviously one of the more ridiculous scenarios, but a bunch of people are like, yeah, this sounds legit. This would explain a lot. And yeah, it's not that far fetched compared to some of the stuff that the high level people are talking about. Like, you know, Gary Nolan uh, talks about interdimensional beings. Yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot. And he, Gary Nolan, you know, he's a very interesting character. He's a very smart guy. He's a professor and he's uh, got lots of patents and he, he works in, uh, I think, computational immunobiology. Like, so he, he does making drugs and uh, yeah, gene therapies and stuff like that. All very, you know, great stuff, uh, advancing the health of, of people. Um, but you know, he he's he's also in a UFO experiencer who had little little men visit him in his bedroom when he was was a child and saw UFOs and has had you know, experiences with entities to kind of talking to him. Uh, and and now he's he's part of this this whole thing where you know he's he's kind of um, you know showing in, introducing Dave Grush to people. Uh, so it's it's you know there's there's a lot of different. A lot of different people in you know, this, this scenario. Like so, so much of it seems, again, I am really haven't been that interested in these things, frankly, until I found your work, because I think your book and your interviews really go a long way to explain so much of why people think what they think and how to debunk it and how to follow it up. And I've always been into myth busting for sure. But more importantly, when it comes to things like your health and, 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 and other issues where I've been talking to experts for a long time, but you're the man on this, you're the guy on this and your book really went a long way to explain this. But, but, but that being said, it does feel like you have to get to the, the starting point, the entry point for a lot of folks is the government, the U S government, the Israeli government, any government, frankly, they know these things. They're hiding these things. Yeah. And, and, and I will never, ever believe that. I don't believe that human beings are capable of that. And, and for one reason, because there's been complex conspiracies that, that people, you know, ended up talking yeah. about, you know, uh, from, from uh, Nixon, uh, everywhere. Like we've heard people eventually blow the whistle. People eventually tell the truth. You can't keep these secrets. But people give so much credit to government agencies. And by the way, the last point I would say is not only does the government keep the secret, it keeps it over generations, meaning something that happened 50 or 75 years ago is being kept secret. And none of the presidents know and none of the agency heads uh, know. And I feel like that's the entry point. And if you if you believe that. I say my personal opinion is, well, you, I've, I've, you've lost trust with me because it's not it's not how. The hu we don't work that way. Human beings don't work that way. Governments don't work that way. They're not nearly as efficient and secretive as people think they might be. What do you think of all that? Yeah, I think that's true. And uh, you know, it's not just the U.S. government. You know, this this uh, narrative that's currently being played out is that other countries also have crash retrieval programs. Uh, Russia has them. China has them. You know, Britain probably has them. And you know, all all these other countries they all know about it. So the amount of people who would know about you know what's actually going on essentially like you know a shadow reality of science and the entire world is just ridiculous you know science doesn't work like that how you can't really comp compartmentalize science so they don't realize that you know they're being they're being fed bits of ufos uh, and that's how scientific discoveries are made no scientific discoveries are made by hard work building on the uh, the work of others uh, and it just doesn't really make any sense. And then there's countries who don't have crash retrieval programs. They do have uh, like surveillance programs, and they, they they spy on other countries. And you know they would want to to expose something like this. You know how do we stop like Iran and North Korea and uh, and other countries like that? You know Pakistan and India. Like why aren't they uh, you know, involved in this? There's just so many people that would be involved. Even if you would just take the U.S. alone. You know, there will be tens of thousands of people. This entirely like you know, separate, um, you know, set of, of of people. And now, you know, it's sure. Like now, you could say somebody has come forward. Someone's actually you know broken the barrier. But it, we haven't actually seen that yet. You know, we've seen someone make some claims that somebody told him some things, and now he's gone to uh, Congress. And apparently, he's given some testimony, and then they're going to look into it. You know, what I anticipate happening is that 
he, I don't, you know, as is my best guess, or I anticipate happening is that he's going to say, we have alien remains at Wright Patterson Air Force Base. And we have these programs are studying it. These are the names of the programs. They're in this hangar. And then the military is going to come back and say, oh, those aren't alien remains. That was a you know crashed uh, you know, MiG twenty nine. This was a a recovered uh, submarine. This was a uh, this was a uh, a satellite that crashed in Canada. And, and the reason why it's these code names. It, it, it's a fo- those are all foreign, uh, and that's yeah. why it's being kept secretive. Exactly, and it's you know there are big programs that do this. There's there's you know what we used to be called the Foreign Technology Exploitation Group, which is now called I think NASIC, N A I S I C. And uh, they, they're basically a very large organization that's dedicated to uh, capturing foreign technology and studying foreign technology and, and reverse engineering it, both for defending against it and for learning anything that we can from it. And these are top secret, super duper top secret. We don't want our adversaries to know that uh, you know, we're studying their stuff. We don't we want to know that it, we certainly don't want them to know that if we figure anything out, about it, so these will be very compartmentalized programs. And the, some of these are big programs. When we recovered that Russian submarine back in, uh, I think it was like '76, that was like something that cost uh, like over three billion dollars in today's money. So these aren't like small programs; these are big programs with 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 lots of people. And you know, if it was alien technology that we were recovering, the amount of people and the amount of money we'd be putting into this would be just ludicrous because it's something that you know, would change the entire world forever. Yeah, all we've got is like some guy saying, you know, I think that these programs here are, are doing you know, alien stuff. And then the military is going to come back and tell Congress secretly because they can't reveal it to the public that no, it's not. And then Congress is going to be like, oh, well, uh, you know, the military has told us this. And then Tim Bircher is going to say, well, I don't believe them. They're lying. It's a big cover-up. And then the whole thing is just going to continue. It's what they're saying in this latest, I believe, is that, I think Grush is saying this, is that those agencies that reverse engineer a captured Chinese Russian sub, what they're doing is they're reverse engineering these alien crafts. And when I hear that again, not knowing anything about physics or weaponry or technology, my, my immediate response to that is it's one thing to reverse engineer another object built on planet Earth with the same raw materials. It's a completely different thing to imagine recreating or rebuilding a foreign craft where you don't have the same raw materials, you can't even identify what they might be. Again, I know nothing, but it seems ridiculous to think that you can reverse engineer some uh, spacecraft or object that was built in another another world. Yeah, certainly not as easily as you could something, say if you capture a, a MiG or something like that, or a fifth generation yeah. fighter from China. Uh, right. Yes, you could you could you could reverse engineer that relatively easy, but if it's something that's you know ten thousand years or a million years more advanced in technology, then maybe not. But you could learn stuff from it. You could study it, and you could actually do experiments, and you could get results. If you have something physical, you can actually you know figure things out. The claim is that we have bodies of the aliens. You know, you can do biological analysis. You can see you know what what are these aliens made of? Uh, do they have similar dna to us are they in fact humans from the future or another dimension so you, you, there are things that you can do and you know material analysis is part of it but you know, the the fact that m- the material analysis is is the only evidence that he said of alienness just seems ridiculous you know, if you have an alien craft that landed you've got an intact alien craft that you know can uh, supposedly do things and there'll be things in it it's not just going to be an inert lump of metal when it lands it's going to be um, it's going to be something that actually has some technology that you can look at and describe. Of course, you know the the the, the good the good excuse for that will be that oh, it is just an inert lump of metal. It's just like some kind of intelligent meta material, and that's that's all that it is. Uh, so you know, there's always an excuse for these things. Right. But you know, if if all you've got is an inert lump of metal, how do you know it's alien? It's just you know it's kind of you're going around in circles here. We don't have good evidence. We have hearsay. And Congress needs to tread very lightly when it's dealing with this. Well, they want to tread very heavily, actually. They want to get the boots on and start stomping around looking for the real evidence. You know, 
this guy, you know, he's a 35 year old uh, guy retired from uh, retired from the intelligence community. There are probably thousands of people in the intelligence community with the same clearance or higher than him. Why doesn't right. Congress just get one of them and ask them, <laughs> or get <laughs> like you know the head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and ask them, or get whoever's in charge of these programs and ask them? I mean, you know, presumably that's what's going to happen. But the truth will out, but because it's classified, we may never actually hear what the truth is, other than that. Oh, oh it didn't really go anywhere. I hope you're wrong about that. Who who in Congress is is pursuing these these leads and trading quote heavily, as you say? Well, uh, there's there's a variety yeah, of people. Uh, yeah, there, there's uh, Marco Rubio is one of them. He's he was the head of the Senate uh, Select Committee of Intelligence, I believe. Uh, there's there's other people. Uh, Mark Warner, who's his Democratic counterpart, uh, Senator Gillibrand uh, has been pursuing it. And Tim Burchett, uh, Republican, uh, has also been very interested in it. But they all seem to have kind of different takes and, and motives about the whole thing. Uh, kind of, I think Gillibrand's you- thing is about like you know supporting the troops. Uh, Burchett's thing is that there's a vast government cover up of of, uh, of UFO visits that go back to biblical times. And uh, Marco Rubio, I think, you know, is just kind of. I don't know. I don't think he really believes it, but he thinks that it's something that you should look right. into. And similar with Warner, uh, have have they? Have any of them ever reached out to you? No, no, no one, no one high up has ever reached out to me. Have yeah, you I ever get reached occasional. Out to any of them? Uh, no, because I, yeah, I wouldn't expect them to reply to me. They'll just think I'm some crank, uh, and I'm sure they get you know, emails from cranks all the time, and it would be kind of a waste of time. And uh, you know, if 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 uh, they want to, you know, if they want to talk to people, they should reach out to people who know about the topic, not not me, right. and get these people to rec- recommend, you know, who should they talk to, right? And you know, my name might come up, or it might be someone uh, like Seth Shostak, who was you know former head of SETI, uh, or you know, maybe even Sean Kirkpatrick. You know, talk to Sean Kirkpatrick and get him to tell you exactly what's going on. Or talk to the, the head of the NSA. Talk to you know people who are very high security clearances. You know, you're a congressperson. You get to do this, and especially the people who are on these these but committees, people, these intelligence committees. Let me go down the rabbit hole. All those people have reason to protect the secrets. That's their job to protect the secrets. They're not going to tell you, as opposed to a quote whistleblower like David Grush, mm-hmm. who's left the government. What do you say to that? Mm-hmm. Well, get the president involved then. Get the president to go and ask them. You know, they have to tell him if he asks. It's uh, it's not impossible for these things to be discovered. There, there was a big um, investigation called the the Church Commission, I think, back in the seventies, yeah. which you know it uncovered a lot of uh, essentially wrongdoing by by the CIA and uh, the intelligence community, and there were some reforms that came out of that. But if you structure things right, you can get uh, access to these things. You know, people talk about uh, how Kirkpatrick, Sean Kirkpatrick, head of Arrow, only has Title X uh, clearance. He needs Title 50. Yeah, so if you want things to move forward, give him Title 50 clearance or find someone with Title 50 clearance. It's not like the, there's, there's yeah, none of right. these people existing in the right. intelligence community. Right. Get one of them to come before the Congressional Committee and, and testify. Get right. one of them, say, well, we want you to look into these things that this Grush guy has just given us. It's, it's, it's going to happen. You know, these, these things are going to happen. The, the only question is, what is the public going to find out? Is you know, The most likely thing, I think, is that really nothing happens and things continue to be debated in public, whereas behind the scenes, it's just like, oh, my God, not this nonsense again. Right, right, uh, right. Yeah, we'll see. Uh, Mick, I could talk to you forever. I appreciate you joining me today. I highly encourage everybody to get your book and follow you on Twitter. I'll say all that stuff on the way out. Thank you so much for joining me, man. Thank you. Thank you. It's been an interesting conversation, interesting times.